the, Ian, that's when the light bulb went off to me was the first time someone gave me a debug camera. Right. In, yeah. Need for Speed Underground. Game engine. Yeah. They're like, here, check out the environment. And I'm like flying around with these controllers. <laughs> mm. And to them, it's totally normal because they've been doing it that way for a decade. I'm the film guy. I'm like, does anybody else see what I'm seeing? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> what? This podcast is brought to you by Backlight. Backlight Creative enhances the entire creative project lifecycle. For pre-production, there's Caltex. For script writing, beat boards, shot lists, and planning. And Backlight Gem, a narrative design platform for games and VR. For post-production, we've got F-Track Studio to manage creative projects with custom pipelines and reviews with CineSync and F-Track Review for high-res, real-time media collaboration. To manage your assets, connect your own storage to Iconic, a scalable cloud-based media asset management platform. You can learn more at backlight.co. And now on to the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to VFX Notes. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters. And as always, I'm joined by Hugo Guerra from Hugo's Desk. Hi, Hugo. Hey. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. This is our second episode with Habib Zagapur. Hi, Habib. How's it going? Hi, guys. Doing great. Thank you. <laughs> Make sure you check out our other chat with Habib about The Perfect Storm, where we talked about um, fluid sims, uh, compositing methods at ILM back then, and you know how visual effects were done 22 years ago. That's a really fun app. Today, we're talking about Habib's own career, which right now centers really on virtual production. Um, Habib, we're going to get to what you're doing now, but I actually wanted to go back to the beginning, like in terms of your early visual effects work, and maybe we could really draw this line to what you're doing now with virtual production. How did it all start for you? Yeah, that's a really great question because uh, I've thought about that recently myself. Um, I think um, Star Wars Episode One was a really good uh, basis for having the pod race, and we were doing the pods crashing, and mm. and we decided, you know, obviously to use physics to for believability. Uh, but John Nolan and I would have these discussions about how to do the crashes and. and um, what made sense was to run it as one simulation, like it was happening for real. And, and because it's a simulation, then you could go back and film it after it crashed. And, and the real life analogy is if you have a, a glass cup and you drop the glass cup and it shatters everywhere, bounces and then shatters, um, you're, if you're shooting this for real, you don't never know which way it's going to bounce for you to mm. film it properly. But if it's a simulation, this is the equivalent of, uh, you know, having something break into thousands of pieces, then after the fact, going and seeing what's the best angle to view it from. That's one of the reasons we didn't use miniatures for the crashing, at least not for the, the ones where they completely break apart. They, we did use the miniature for a Cibola Pod's pod that slides over the sand. Those shots were really cool, yeah. cool uh, live. But, um, when we're starting to do these shots whole, basically I call it like a master scene. So you have this master scene that just plays and then you're able to film all the shots. Uh, that's where I was, you know, we were always talking about flying the pods for real, you know, like having a simulation where you're actually flying and like it's a, a big video game and you're trying to, you know, simulation of real thing and, and, and everybody's trying to fly against each other. and more or less the way the pod race was set up the pods were simulated rigid bodies and the animators were guiding them and the rigid bodies would basically follow as best they could within the realms of physics uh, very few times we had to cheat that on the pod to follow better uh, if it was some really fast move but you know this to me um even even um i think Playing around in that world was a was a big light bulb, and then on the perfect storm, where we're having these dynamic ships 
you know, ship to ship filming and having it all happen in real time and, and the director's able to direct it. That was like a second step. But then uh, going to uh, work on Need for Speed, on Need for Speed Most Wanted, they need to do the cinematics. And we knew that it would cost $200 million to do an hour and a half of all CG, like uh, what we had seen with Final Fantasy. And, and it, you would get near, near photoreal, you know, uh, not quite breaking the, the uncanny valley uh, believability. And so I thought, what if we start with real people and, and make them look CG? by dumbing them down visually. Mm. And so we did a whole bunch of tests where we were analyzing a Final Fantasy character and a real character, and we would take real people and do things to them and film them to see how we can make them look not real. You know, make them look CG. So instead of getting 95% to real, we would start with 100% real and knock off 5%. <laughs> so we were able to do nine, you know, ninety minutes of cinematics, you know, with uh, Derek Hamilton, Josie Moran, Dean McKenzie, you know, all the usual suspects. So, um, but in that project, we were shooting all green screen. This was the first time the production was all green screen, happening at the same time as Sky Captain. And I don't know the exact dates, Ian. You'll have to do some forensic analysis, mm -hmm. but it was kind of simultaneous. I don't know, but we. Um, we did have the game engine on location, and I, I had an ultimate green screen comping, so I could fly to that location in the game, and uh, the actors would be on green screen with the green car, and I and we could see if the composition would work. Now I was we tried to track cameras using motion capture, but it actually wasn't working because of the heat from the lamps. Even by masking off all the lamps for the cameras, we were getting er 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 erroneous stuff. So that technology has come a long way. We know there's many ways to track cameras now, including on your phone. But back then, you know, it just wasn't enough. I really wanted to have a simulcam, basically, back then. This is 2005. Um, but we settled for basically roughly matching it with a controller just to see where it's going to work for the location. You know, the director could see at least before they start shooting. So that was a big, you know, uh, th then we ended up rendering the backgrounds for real in Engine in, from Nefis and Most Wanted. Those are 8K renders or 4K renders that came out of the engine and were comped by a facility, Rainmaker, and Jason Dalswell teams. So <clears throat> that was a kind of a merging of the two worlds already, the game and film side, you know. But it wasn't until I went to Microsoft where... They said we needed some way to work better with Hollywood, and I thought of this merging of tools. It's like, you know, I was just dying to bring the visual quality of engines to the stage because I'd seen what things look like when they're filming with Motion Builder, and I felt, you know, you could bring that quality of a real time engine on set, and then they can preview lighting and shadows and all these things. And so we put the Photon project together uh, by, you know, having a meeting with James Cameron and Joe Terry and pitching the idea. And then uh, we did a demo for them in February uh, 2011. And uh, so things happened from that point on where, you know, um, we were able to deploy it on uh, uh, Disney's Order of Seven in 2012 with uh, Alex McDowell. And a Jungle Book was the first big project. Uh, Order of Seven didn't finish. They, they stopped the film. But Jungle Book uh, was the first big feature we worked on with Rob Legato, and we were able to deploy the tools. We'd, we'd customized the rendering and added so many things to it that were all for film, uh, and as well as this uh, multi-networked, multi-user network, so, so we could have multiple people working on it at the same time. Uh, and that's because we were imagining the impatient director asking for 10 things and wanting it right away. And so we're like, oh, you know how I solved that one. Uh, so, you know, everything, I think that was ground zero and the start of a lot of things changing. Uh, we were able to work on Ready Player One after that and even up the networking even further so that 
you were being Maya Motion Builder or Unity. We, we chose Unity as the engine because we wanted to get assets in really fast on set. Um, and I'd seen that work on Unity's side. And then we completely customized the rendering to be filmic. Uh, but on Ready Player One, we had bi-directional networking. So it didn't matter if you move something in Unity or Maya or Motion Builder, they would all adjust. And, and there was no master machine. They were all synchronizing. Um, you know, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, from those projects, a lot of ideas float out and there's a lot of, uh, you know, movement in virtual production that makes me very happy because I spent a lot of years just doing demos for people and, and facilities and they don't know what to do with it. You know, you're showing them like, you know, we can render near real time this, you know, re rendering real time near a photo reel or close to the lighting you want. Uh, and the things that John Farrow and Spielberg were able to do on those two films was get close to the final look with their DPs and with the decisions they make. <clears throat> and then um, that way, when they're cutting it together, they already have an idea what it's going to be, if it's going to work or not. It's a lot closer to the finish, finished product when they're filming. So I think that's, you know, now we know so many things have evolved uh, since then and we have the rendering engines are pushing uh, amazing uh, you know ray tracing and um, different lighting uh, details as, and then at the same time you have LED screens so it's a it's a whole revolution I think uh, all around it, it's it's funny looking back at at your work especially on the games industry where I kind of see like now it's kind of all kind of merged but it wasn't always like this you know I remember when I was still at the mill in 2012, where game engines and games in general were a bit of a dirty word, you know, like not a lot of people wanted to talk about it, not a lot of people wanted to use it. And it was still kind of considered like a very childish thing to even work in, in video games. And it's so funny to see like the progression of how now we've changed our perception of games engines and how now it's like embedded into the visual effects pipeline. But these kind of things have been happening for so long. Like I look at your portfolio, like for example, you worked on Rise Son of Rome. And that game, I remember when it came out, was the first like was the next generation, was Xbox One, wow, and it yeah. was like uh, like at the at the cusp of the PS4. And that game was doing Xbox things one. in two thousand. Yeah. Yeah. That Xbox One, yeah. The the the, the actual one. <laughs> yes. The, the the first. But that game was doing things in two thousand thirteen that it was mind blowing. Like the quality of the graphics and the visual fidelity of that game was just like mind blowing. When I played that game for the first time, I think that was one of the games that really switched the light on me. And I kind of looked at the game, my God, I can't believe this is running on a four year old console because the, the Xbox one, when it came out was already four year old technology, you know, it was already yeah. old technology and it was running on this part in the French, this shit machine. <laughs> and it was already looking amazing. And so imagine what you could do with a proper quadro card or a proper machine uh, going behind it, you know? So I think that game specifically rise of Sun Sun in Rome really opened my mind to the world of, of render engines, you know? It was, a, uh, you know, the Crytek team was amazing to work with. The, that engine is really amazing. And so uh, Shabbat and the team there, uh, really, really uh, high-end, incredible um, work. And, and I got to spend a lot of time with them in Frankfurt, actually. And, <clears throat> and I think, you know, the, 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 the console, the, every time you have a new console, it's a, it's a completely different experience to try and build something for it. Uh, it's unlike anything I've experienced in visual effects because you have this complete unknown of, you know, you have no idea what the final power is going to be, what the final memory is going to be. It's always in flux, you know, what the color response is. And, you know, the, you keep getting prototypes. And it, 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 I have so many stories about transitioning from PS2 to Xbox 360 and then Xbox 360 to Xbox One. But to make it a long story short, you got 32 megs going into 512 megs going into 8 gig. Uh, you know, it, that's because yeah, this was a launch title. It was know, a launch title. I, yeah, and so there's you no, guys didn't know anything. Yeah. yeah, there's no handbook to say, hey, now your character should be X amount of polygons. There's nothing. You have to determine on your own, well, what is an appropriate resolution for my environment? What is the appropriate resolution for textures? What's the appropriate, you know, quality for audio? 
all of these things have to be refigured out, you know, the number of dynamic objects. Um, but if I were to re rewind a little further, I should say on Need for Speed Underground, we, we had this cinematic mode where in the drag race, we wanted to have camera cuts like you're watching Fast and Furious. And so we built this tool called ICE, in-game camera editor, and it was basically real-time cinematography using the controller, and it, you could also edit. And you had a choice of if your camera was attached to the car or in the world space. And this tool got really, really refined, and I think uh, a lot of origins of what we did in Photon and Exposure later, now running in Unity, a lot of those controls were basically honed from that point in 2003. That tool got put into James Bond, Everything or Nothing, for all those mm -hmm. cutscenes. So every time you see a cutscene in the Need for Seed Underground, it's actually using ice, like under the hood. That's oh, what's wow. running the cameras. And then they took that and exposed it to players in skate. They simplified the interface, and that's what you use when you do a skate move, and then you do camera cuts, you're using ice. And, and so it kept getting refined, and I, I was really happy about, um, you know, when I started doing Photon, it was a no-brainer to have that kind of interface. It's just the power of using some of the game tools, you know, the, the tools that came. But that, the, Ian, that's when the light bulb went off, to me, was the first time someone gave me a debug camera. Right, it, yeah. And Need for Speed On Underground. Engine. Yeah, they're like, here, check out the environment. And I'm like flying around with these controllers. <laughs> and mm. to them, it's totally normal because they've been doing it that way for a decade. I'm the film guy. I'm like, does anybody else see what I'm seeing? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> what? And, and it was, and of course, your new graphics were going to catch up. It was, an, mm, yeah, that, was that was like you were watching the graph. Even though that was on a PS2, <clears throat> you know, so it's been amazing. It, it's been it's, a little longer than I thought, but, you know, I would look silly in conferences saying the future of visual effects is real time and everybody would laugh. Yeah. And, and it's it's so funny because closer. like like the the games engines people they kind of like are so apologetic about when it goes slow you know i remember i was working at ubisoft for for a couple of months doing a cinematic and we were rendering uh, 4k footage from their engine from snowdrop and they were trying to put it in real time don't know why i just needed it for comp and they were like apologizing to us. Oh, I'm so sorry. We can only render at three frames per second. We can't render at more than three frames per second. This is gonna take a while. It's gonna take so long. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like talking to them, like, what are you talking about? Like three frames per second is just fine. Like it's awesome. I can't even imagine. It's can't, all I, relative. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. Coming from like coming from Arnold, like where everything took like 20 hours or 10 hours. And I think it's just a different world. Now, of course, we have that collision of that world, but mm. this was not the case in 2010, 2012. These worlds were very separated, uh, you know, the, the real-time engines and, and the visual effects in, in engines. And I, I, it's so funny. It's, it's amazing to see your progress in that sense. My dog's it's eating. Uh, uh, he's biting on his, on his fox <laughs> tail. That's, what's, that's the noise you're hearing. Okay. It's, it's called funny. Max, right? Max, yes. Yeah. Max. Yeah, let me oh, bring he's, he's, Come here, he's Max. beautiful. Come here. Come here. Max. Oh, this is, this is <laughs> the content yes. everyone wants to see. Yes. Oh, look at Max. People want to see dogs. <laughs> yes. They do not want to see us. No. I can tell you that. <laughs> what do you oh, say, Max? Max? What, what's your opinion? <laughs> oh. He's going to um, take a nap here now. <laughs> that's Good fine. Good boy. Good boy. Look, I I think it is fascinating, Habib, the collision of VFX real time, and particularly what you were doing with virtual cinematography. You mentioned um, exposure was one of your tools, is one of your yes. tools, and you mentioned Ready Player One and Jungle yep. Book. Tell me a bit about the the what you were doing there with that tool. You you had an outfit called Digital Monarch Media. Um, but tell me about the different kind of tools, hardware and software that you were developing to enable this virtual cinematography. Yeah, in the beginning, uh, when we were developing this at Microsoft, it was called Photon. And we were using, uh, I, I was basically using a, an OptiTrack mocap bar to do demos because it was basically the closest I could get to 
a motion cap, you know, motion capturing my camera move, mm. but have it be precise and portable. And the bar was about, I don't know, two and a half feet wide. And this kind of cross section aluminum extrusion, it would always uh, raise eyebrows at the airport security. And this, <laughs> you know, you basically, uh, it was th three pre-calibrated cameras and you just put it on a tripod and you, you hold your controller. Uh, oh my God. I actually had, um, I usually have that, the mocap marker thing on my desk. Um, so, so that gets tracked and then we were sending that to the engine, you know, so you, you basically, whatever hand movements you did, uh, it was being recorded and then you watch the result of it on a, on a, t on a screen or on a big TV. And then every time there was a new device, we would adopt it. So, uh, there was the, uh, structure depth sensor tracking, uh, you know, this, that you, you mm. know, use, uh, to scan things. So that went on your iPhone and we started using that, got, got even more portable. Um, and then when, when we had uh, the Tango, we were using the Tango, the actual original tablet. Then they put the Tango in the Lenovo phones. Uh, I have one of those hanging around somewhere, somewhere here. And so, the, you know, it was precise tracking because it had depth sensors. It could even work in a dark theater. And I was always amazed at wherever I would go, I could turn this thing on and get super amazing tracking. And now you have phones, you know, the iPhone 12 Pro and the iPad Pro and all these phones that have the depth, depth sensors can get pretty darn close to very professional tracking. And so the whole time it was all about getting the performance of the cinematographer and, and also simulating real rigs from real life. So in photo and, and exposure, we had simulations of real world rigs like dollies, uh, cranes, jib arms, you know, spline dollies, uh, drones, you know, a drone actually feels like a drone with all the inertia so that when you're performing on these cameras, you're getting results that look like real world results, the results that you see, uh, if you were flying a real drone or if you're pushing a real dolly. So everything had inertia and physics and, um, Wes Potter was the developer to do the physics for the cameras. He's also the guy who did the physics for Need for Speed. Most wanted. Oh, coincidentally. Uh, so uh, it's really interesting to get these kinds of technologies and then use them for uh, filmmaking. You know, and and the things we had to add. You know, in 2010 uh, to Unity, with uh, we had to do high dynamic range buffers for the rendering, linear lighting, uh, um, depth of field. These are really critical for filming, and these are things that were not available. Off, off the shelf in, in something like Motion Builder. But we yeah. could bring those technologies specifically for film and, and have live mocap from several machines, you know, several streams. Um, so I think um, seeing and experiencing the real time, you know, working on games had that result. I would have never predicted that, you know, that you go from one complete bubble to another complete bubble and you're like, whoa. The, the oxygen in here is different, you know. I mean, it, it was a transition, you know, just to how to know how to work on games was took me four months to put my head on right. And yeah. and so I think the evolution of the tools has been really interesting because you're kind of cross hybrid, you know, cross pollinating from different things. And 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 the game and game folks took a lot of things for granted, you know. Like, yeah, I'm flying around the environment in real time. What's the problem? <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it, it, from, some, from a point of view of someone who has not been able to do that, I remember doing demos for a director who was used to, you know, was, who'd worked on animated features. And I brought his entire city in the engine. And he could fly from the houses of one character to the other character, all in real time. And, and he had to sit down. He's like... <laughs> It's never been able to do that because it would take hours to load one of them, you know, mm. in, into a DCC. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's, it's just really uh, incredible to take, to harness the powers of, of something and use it for something different, you know. What's really interesting is that the strength of this has really made itself apparent in previous and I loved what you did for films like Greyhound 
and also stowaway where you're essentially giving this virtual camera, you know, which is this thing you've made to a DP or the director or, or anyone really. And, you know, they're imagining quite complicated scenes in the case of Greyhound, it's ship to ship submarine type scenes on, on moving water a la yeah. perfect storm that's right in stowaway it was in space yeah um yeah. and i think th- the concept is because it's for previews you can do as many iterations as you need to do to get the shot exactly and i think that's the strength of it right at the moment yeah what's what was one of the great things uh i just grabbed one here this is a <laughs> prototype mm. here uh one of them <laughs> So it runs off a Sony battery so you can be on a normal film set and power oh, that's it. That's awesome. And two Xbox controllers. That's right. That's, awesome. that's because um, <laughs> that's so you have the shoulder width. This is a feature uh, thanks to Scott Anderson's feedback. Is it, it, When you have shoulder width, you can do better rotations. Uh, and DPs like the weight of this thing, you know. Um, mm. But, yeah, one of, the, one of the great things watching uh, Joe Penna on Stowaway um, working with his DP uh, Clemens was you can hear them, you know, they're looking at the inside of the ship and f- playing the motion of what's going to happen and, and finding shots and having the discussion of what if we shoot it from here? What if we shoot it from there? And they're like, well, let's, let's follow that thing and we can land on this thing. And as they're talking, they're just trying it right there. Mm. And, and so, the freedom to explore things in real time and be able to perform the camera move before you're even on set uh, is huge because you're going to discover, you have the time uh, to give yourself that discovery, you know, and, and that's what makes me really happy is uh, enabling that kind of hands-on for key creators, the, you know, the directors, the DPs, uh, visual effects supervisors and production designers uh, to, to have those discoveries and maybe hopefully soon, it, and, and I know it's happened already, is the whole design process is part of it. So the production designer makes the environment, they go in there with the DP and director, they look at it and they start filming virtually and say, you know what, let's, let's have these doors be t- taller and, and, and the corridor should be narrower to give you more oppression and however you feel. And, you, and they can be there in VR at the same time to get a sense of scale for when the set's actually built. So, you know, on order of seven, uh, even though the film didn't complete, Alex McDowell and I both saw right away something we hadn't predicted, which was just allowing that kind of communication between all the key creators completely changed the results. Everybody's work was improved and better and iterated because they could see the final sets and be in them. And Mm. that's what... Uh, I think the whole real time revolution is really all about is, is you know, everybody's all these powerful creators' work is amplified, communication is sp- sped up, as though it's already done. It's so it's only natural that end result's going to be much better. And we know uh, on Jungle Book there was many iterations of some of the sets, some of the scenes, because they could shoot it, cut it together, look at it, and go that could be better and they would try it again absolutely it's exciting and one thing i think this might also feed into some of hugo's thinking about virtual production is that because um habib you're coming from a visual effects background where you also understand film language i feel like it's not just about getting crazy shots or any kind of shot or millions of iterations it's actually about understanding cameras and so your tools seem to have those things you mentioned, like dollies, moves, and, and jib moves, and whatever else, so that it has a film language to it. I felt like for a little while in the previous world, there were crazy camera moves, right? Because you could move the camera anywhere in a Maya play blast. <laughs> yeah. This is like. Hugo, when you must we, have seen this, right? This is like when we got fonts in Word, right? And you got, the, <laughs> yeah. you got the ransom note uh, documents, right? It's like, oh my God, I can have a different font for every line. Mm. So yeah, with every new tool, we have the people who have to take it to extremes. 
but yeah, we you know we we put physical limits on things, so you you know your dolly can only go so fast or whatever the limit you know the real dolly to be. Uh, limit your your start and end points. Have the ease and out, ease in and ease out. Um, and then we've even had a, a a nice test with the new Unity virtual cameras, uh, working across uh, different cities. So somebody in Montreal is driving a camera in my scene, as as I'm watching it, you know, and, mm. and I'm and I'm telling them what to do. So you, that kind of opens it up for a lot of remote work to be super interesting. But um, yeah, I think the film language is important, and also like when we simulated lenses, we made sure we put the limitation of how close you can focus uh, on the actual lens. So you're like, okay, this is the prime lens we're gonna use. Well, you can't focus closer than nine inches, so don't. You know, like it won't let you. <laughs> so you'll know in your preview um, what how it's gonna work. That's really important, and also like not only like on previews, like Ian was saying. But there was also a time where video games had the same exact issue, you know, where mm -hmm. video games were not respecting the laws of physics on cameras and also the laws of the actual emotional of a camera, you know, like the distortion of the lens and the diffuse of the lens and the actual flare of the lens. We are now getting better, of course, especially on the new generations where the new consoles are so powerful that you can actually have all that processing happening on top like the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, but but there was a, a pretty grim time, especially on the PS3 and the Xbox 360, where everything looked very fake. And not only cameras were, movements were crazy and nuts and completely disconnected with reality, but the also it was an enormous amount of glows and glares and everything just looked really fake and really bad. And I, I, I love that now we're having this merging of the people from VFX, the people from cinematography, the people from games, because all three of us, all three worlds will be better for it, you know, all of them, because they will learn from the cinematographers and the cinematographers will learn from the engine and the engine will learn from the VFX people. And everyone is just going to chip in a bit of reality in these shots, both in games, both in films and in TV. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Like everything is getting a little bit more realistic and a little bit better at the video games industry as well, you know. Yeah, the lines are blurring too, you know. It yeah. used to be very hard lines, but now, you know, to watch a TV series versus a film, you know. Yeah, uh, it, there's it's, nothing. It, it, it's no. pretty close. Uh, and then, you know, the game, the game visuals uh, uh, are, are are up there so it's do you want this interactive do you want to you know do you want to experience it linear uh, you know one of the things i was always after was the whole what's the convergence of film and games you know mm. uh, that was a big one for me and we were always having these crazy thoughts about it and and when vr came around it was like oh this is interesting because you could experience a story that's linear but be in it you know uh and and now with the visuals kind of catching up uh, it's all it's all different ways you can tell the stories and how long you want to tell the stories absolutely that's another that's another revolution about to happen although i know it's uh, it's been happening for a while but it's not completely like world dominating which is vr and i think that is still the problem with VR really, like VR is amazing, but it's the, the entering point is still a problem for most people. You know, most people don't have the rig to run it or most people don't want to mess with all the cables. They don't want to mess with like a complicated setup or even having such a powerful computer. But that, that is just going to go away in terms of technology as we evolve. Uh -huh the headsets are going to be lighter and lighter and they're going to be more powerful and less cabled and more free. And and I think the democratization of it will just happen naturally. And then, yes, then we will have proper VR content. Because at the time, I, I think we are still kind of... Even the most famous VR headset, which is the PSVR, there's still only like a couple of million units out there. There's not a lot. You know, It's not enough to be that kind of scale that is like world domination almost like where people which becomes mainstream it's not mainstream enough yet and i think it's the the entry point the entry uh, uh, point is too expensive but also too complicated for most people you know yeah i agree i Definitely feel like it's gonna be it's gonna be uh super interesting to see that evolve yeah 
I was going to say Hibby, but I feel like it's people like you who could make amazing, more amazing content for VR and kind of, you know, push it out that way. And now you're going to announce on VFX Notes that that's exactly what you're about to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've had uh, some really interesting tests um, while in VR. It's pretty amazing to just fire it up. And, you know, uh, I've actually worked with uh, an architect to um, have them see the scale of things. Uh, that's what VR helps you with, is how big, mm. how big is, you know, is there the scale right on your structure? So that it, it it's amazing how immersive it feels, especially you, you know that when you take the visors off, it's so jarring when you take them off. <laughs> You're literally transported, you know, back yeah from somewhere. Absolutely. Unbelievable. One thing, uh, one thing I want to say uh, that I forgot to mention. I really, really need to mention for Perfect Storm. Uh, Two key guys that uh, helped me on Perfect Storm. One was Masi Oka. Um, Masi has, is now a famous actor. He was the actor on Heroes. And uh, yeah. at the time, he was uh, a TA uh, just working in ILM. And someone came to him and said, Hey, you know, there's this really smart TA that he, he thinks uh, he's going to be able to help us on Perfect Storm. You know, do you want to work with him? I'm like, Sure. Bring him up. So he, Masi comes to me, he's like, uh, can I look at the fluid dynamic code, you know? And, uh, and I'm thinking, like, <laughs> like you're going to be able to tell anything from that? Sure, why not? And, and Typical it, question that yeah. someone comes up to you and asks you that, of course. So he comes back the next day with, I'm not kidding, the printout that thick. He's holding this printout, and he's like, the next day, he's like, I've looked at the code and I think we can make the FFTs uh, by faster by a factor of 10. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was like, oh, hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you do that. Yes. <laughs> Thumbs up. Um, and so, did he and, do it? Yeah. Did, and he, and, and, and he, he also wrote, um, he wrote plugins for Maya to make the particle splashes behave as though they're happening over, um, uh, you know, you know how a big splash comes out and then the wind blows the, the low density parts back, but the main density keeps going. So he wrote a plugin that, that measures density and does that for the splashes. So all the, all the splashes use that, use that density. And then Chris Horvath was the other, uh, mm. the other R and D guy who, uh, built a plugin for us that would, uh, take anything intersecting with the ocean and generate a spline that would emit particles based on the angle of attack and the velocity and give us a splash. And this thing was absolutely amazing. It worked uh, fantastically. There's a shot where the Andrea Gale gets hit by a wave on the side and the animators jolted it like this for the impact. Or I think maybe we did, we used physics, but one way or another, it moves just a few inches, and the resulting splash was this really cool thing that just water just squeezed <laughs> out of it, you know, because we're nudging it. So those two things, I, you know, the container ships, the containers falling, every single container had it, would get its own uh, realistic splash. All the bow splashes from the ships, uh, it was amazing. So yeah. those are all the but things that came came together. And then one of the things Masi did was uh, we had the problem where in one frame, the a 70 foot wave moves so fast that once you emit particles in the next frame, your particles are about three feet too, too high. The wave already dropped. So we kept having this problem with the gap between the particles and the ocean. Masi wrote this plugin that basically sucked all the particles to the surface. So it would just move with it, kind of like an air suction effect. Anyway, it's a little stuff, you know. <laughs> that's amazing that's oh amazing. awesome i'm so glad you mentioned chris horbath i talked to him about deep impact and some very particular shots he did there and then also about tweak right was it tweak software or tweak films that was basically oh, yeah. his company that specialized in Jim very Warham efficient him, right i think both of yeah them. very efficient water sims for a few years so yeah amazing talent awesome. really good well 
Habib, it's been great having these two conversations with you about your own work and career and journey in virtual production, but also about The Perfect Storm. I hope everyone checks out that other piece we did on that amazing Wolfgang Peterson film. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Hugo. Um, it's been really fun. Fantastic. Thank you.